So here we go. I'm a little nervous because, because I'm excited. Because the message is the same, yet the content keeps changing. Amen. So we're going to get right in the word. How many here have heard the old adage about the pig and the chicken? They're walking down the street and they've seen a sign that says ham and eggs for $2.95, right? And the chicken says, well, there goes our contribution to society. And the pig says, well, for you, it's a contribution, but for me, it's total commitment. Amen? <laughs> so you cannot be a believer until you realize that your former life was wretched. <laughs> that your former life was wretched because then you won't think that you need a savior. So then it will be difficult for you to submit to his lordship because you don't think that you need one. Amen? And until you realize that you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, wrestling with your sin-sick soul, sins of the flesh, okay? Because there are sins of the flesh and sins of the heart. Whoremongering, that's sins of the flesh, or sin of the flesh. Debauchery, addiction of sorts. And then the sins of the heart and mind. And we got them. Envy, jealousy, arrogance, bigotry, hatred, pride, and self-righteousness. So you cannot and will not change something that you enjoy and worship. Amen? You cannot change or you will not change if you like those things if you worship those things. And sometimes we don't realize that we worship self-righteousness. We don't realize that we worship our arrogance. We don't realize that we worship our bigotry. You cannot sing and dance your way out of sin and temptation. Hooten and hollering is not the answer, but commitment. Can you say that with me? Commitment. You know, there is a gauge for almost anything and everything. So I wish someone would invent a commitment-ometer, right? So we can be gauged in how committed we are in anything and everything that we put our hands to. You know, are you half-heartedly doing it because you were forced or because you want to gain something out of it? Or are you really committed because you realize that your priorities are in line with the word. See, without commitment to anything, nothing, 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 I'll say that again, happens. You cannot conquer what you're not committed to. You cannot conquer what you're not committed to. If you're not committed to invest in yourself to be disciplined, to change, to dare, to believe, and be different, then don't expect any profits or dividends because nothing will happen. If we can go to Galatians 6, 7. Amen. <clears throat> and if you're there, say amen. Okay, I'm there. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Amen? So today, now, is the time to examine our level of commitment. Is your vision cross-eyed or tangled? I'm talking about, I'm not talking about your physical vision. I'm talking about your vision in life. Is it tangled? Is it cross-eyed? Are you just getting older, wasting time, and losing life? Where are you right now in your commitment? Jacob, in the Bible, worked seven years for the woman he loved or wanted, okay? Rachel. If we can go to Genesis 29 so that you know what I'm talking about. I'm sure you know the story. 
Genesis 29. 25. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Small. All right. And in the morning, okay, so he was working for Laban for seven years to finally get the woman he wanted, right, Rachel? But in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Now, I don't know about you, but this man worked, what, 14 years, seven years for the woman he wanted. And some of you, us, here today, are not even willing to work seven hours. Right? This is total commitment. He was not going to give up on the woman that he wanted to be with. So even though he was cheated out of seven years, he worked another seven to get the one he wanted. Faith, as the word of God says, by hearing, comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's in Romans 10:17. Why does faith come by hearing? Because when you hear the word of God, when you hear the word of God, something happens to you. It's not just a word that is being dispensed that goes over your head that will cause you to change. It's something that penetrates deep into your heart that will cause your faith to rise up. The word of God does that to our soul to our thinking and to our spirit. So when you hear the word of God, it passes through your ears and it passes through your mind and it settles in your heart. But if it goes over your head, like some of you, okay, at the end of this night, you won't remember what I'm talking about. If it goes over your head, then you won't know that commitment is important, that commitment is what got us saved. Jesus did not Dilly dally, he did not contemplate. Even though in his humanity at the Garden of Gethsemane, when he says, Father, if there be any other way for this mission to be accomplished, take it from me. That was his humanity, which is why he was asking his disciples to pray with him an hour. But did they? No, they fell asleep. Right? They couldn't even commit to one hour praying with our Lord. But he said, but nevertheless, let your will be done. Because he knew that our, our um, salvation is depending on it. Our redemption is depending on it. So when you hear the word of God, you begin to pattern the course of your life and action and behavior to God's promise. Okay, when you know that it is a promise from God, when you know that you've read it in the word and you've heard it be proclaimed and you can find it in the Bible when you search the scripture, then you know that you've got a promise and God does not lie. He is faithful and he is committed, so it shall come to pass. That's when you know that you hear the word of God because faith gets built up in you. Amen? When you hear the word of God, something gets ignited inside of you. The ignited spirit will jump and do something about it, right? It compels you to do something about it. And the engrafted word of God as let's go to James 121. This is, this is like one of my favorite books, James. 
the engrafted word of God is able to save your soul. Amen. And if I can find it, okay. Amen. It says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So we should let that settle in for a moment that the engrafted word of God is able to save our soul. You know, have you heard of skin graft, right? You know, when you take something out of somewhere, part of your body, to put on another part of your body where it needs new skin to grow, that's grafting. And it takes a little while for it to stick. It has to be put on there and let it connect. So, the word of God needs to connect with us. The word of God, or we need to connect with the word. The word of God needs to stick. And how will it stick if you're not hearing it? How will it stick if you're not studying it? How will it stick if no one is proclaiming it? Right? So the word of God, the engrafted word of God, is able to save your soul. You cannot and will not change on the word, again, that just goes over your head. You know, it's a lot easy to preach to someone, but how well are you living it? How well are you showing them instead of just telling them? You know the old saying, do as I do, or do as I say, not, not as I do? Okay, that's why we have a lot of messed up children right now, because of that. You do what I say, but don't do what I do. You know, someone calls, and you say, I'm not here. Right? That's lying. So then you get upset with your kids when they start mimicking or copying that. Okay? That's your commitment level to that person calling. Right? You're dodging their calls, and especially if your kids know that that's a friend. Anyway, that's why... There are so many Christians that are ineffective. Amen. What are the things distracting you from throwing yourself, your all, into something? Do you have any passion? What are you willing to commit to? What are you willing individually as a person to commit to? I have some quotes here that I, I again, they kept changing for the last three weeks, so bear with me, I can hardly contain myself. So, um, you know, I was, I was reading um, Genesis, you know, I, I really like that story about Jacob and Rachel and Leah and all of that, because out of that, you know, came the tribe of Judah, right? So, are you a Levi? You know, their names meant something, Leah, you know, felt like she was the hated one. But God saw that, right? Because she was not the one that was chosen. God saw that, and she opened up her womb, like, plenty of times. So Levi, the third son of Jacob, the meaning of that is attached, or to be joined in Hebrew, attached. So are you attached to a greater cause? In other words, are you committed to a greater cause? Are you committed to this church? Are you committed to the man of God? Are you committed to your marriage, to your spouse, to your friends? Are you committed to your job? Or is it just another paycheck that you receive, right? If that's the case and you need to evaluate yourself, why am I here? Because if you believe that that's not for you, then you need to commit to doing something to change your situation instead of wasting your time and the company's time when somebody else can actually enjoy that job. Amen? 
So if it's not for you anymore, then you need to rise up and be able to commit to that which you are seeking after. Amen? Are you committed to anything other than your weak, willed, sorry, old, raggedy excuses? You know, I, I say that because we are so quick to say yes to an invitation, and then we are so quick to change our minds when something better comes along. Unbelievable. All right, so are you committed to your word? Because you know what? I realize that if, you're, if you are two-faced, you know, you're, what does pastor say? You talk on the both sides of your neck. I actually had a picture of that, right? Then, you know, don't think that your prayers are going to really be effective or heard because you're saying one thing and yet you're confessing another on the next breath. So that's not being committed to your own words. Are you a taker or a sucker? Are you a spiritual leech or a parasite? Do you take more than you give? Do you give as good as you get? Hallelujah. If you say you're connected, do you give as good as you get? Or do you just take and take and take and you don't have anything to give? I find that hard to believe. You know, when we come to church, I know we come with a spirit of expectancy and that's what God wants us to come with, right? But do you ever come thinking that you're about to give, that you're about to be a blessing, that you're about to impart something on someone do you think about that or do you just show up and get fed? Oh, yeah, I come to church because I get fed really well. Well, that's good. But what do you do with that feeding afterwards? What do you do with what you've learned? What do you do with what you've gotten, with what you've received? Do you apply it elsewhere or do you just sit on it because it's so good that you can't share it? Are you a casual saint or are you a committed one? Occasional, part-time, partial. Who wants a spouse like that? Who wants a friend like that, right? Part-time husband or wife. Okay, I will be faithful to you Monday through Thursday, but come weekend, man, it's all or nothing, right? And pretty much what I'm talking about is, okay, we're off for the weekends because it's all about me. I mean, who wants that relationship? Are you a real Jesus follower or are you just a fan on the sideline, right? Thinking that you're pleasing to him by just watching but really not plunging in because either you're afraid that you will be rejected or be made fun of. You know, the rejection part is real because you will be rejected. Some of the things that you will say when people don't want to hear it will be rejected, especially when they're not ready to hear it because they don't want to commit. When they don't want to change, they will reject you. And you know what? I realized that I made it through. I lived, I survived, and it's okay. Because if you're just a fan, then that means you're just following from afar. You don't want to get close enough because you're afraid of getting hurt. So now is the time to realize our level of commitment. How committed are we to our walk? How committed are we? You know, the word, what is the word? The word um, Christian was used like three times in the New Testament, but the word disciple was used over 260 times, okay? There is a big correlation because you cannot really be a disciple if you're not a Christian, right? And you cannot be a Christian if you're not his disciple. 
However, there is a big difference of just being a Christian, that's just being a fan, than being a disciple who is willing to lay down everything, all, willing to forsake all for the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. So, you know, there was this young, wealthy man, right, that, that um, sought Jesus and asked him, like he was really excited to ask, you know, the Lord a question saying, you know, what? shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, after he actually um, told Jesus the litany of things that he did and didn't do, right? I follow this, I didn't do that, I did this, all right? And Jesus was probably like being very patient with him, smiling and saying, okay, that's good, but you know, you must sell your possessions and give it to the poor. And with that answer, that young, rich man went away with a heavy heart. He was sad. See, Jesus was not interested in his wealth. Jesus was not interested in his possessions. He was interested in his heart, in his commitment, in his willingness to forsake all if he needed to. He wasn't, that was not the time to sell his, whatever, his possessions that he had. It was just, saying, well, this is what you must do, that you should be willing to forsake all if you want to partake in that eternal life, that kingdom. And he went away. Can you imagine? He went away sad. That means he counted the cost, at least. He counted the cost, and he said, no dice. I am not willing to, to uh, leave my earthly belongings just yet to follow you. So what I'm saying is God does not delight in fools, right? We learn that in the scriptures. He does not delight in fools, meaning if you make a vow to God, he expects you to pay it. He expects you to fulfill it. He expects you to do it. So if you're promising God to follow him, then you need to follow through with what you've promised him because he followed through with what he promised you. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't work to where I'm going to serve God when it's convenient. I'm going to serve God when it's easy. And I'm going to shout and praise and holler and worship him when my life is good. Then what's the point of commitment? I mean, in marriage... Right? When you're exchanging vows, you're saying for rich or for poor, for better or worse, in sickness and in health. I mean, come on, the preacher is already warning you right there and then. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, I, I, I thought about that. I'm like, he's saying you for richer or for poorer, right? I mean, that was the time to say, you know what? I have the right to change my mind, you know, count the cost because, you know, sometimes even past the engagement, past uh, all of that, the, the rehearsals, you know, they have cold feet, but that's not a good example, but, you know, I'm just saying it's kind of like an analogy that, you know, you're being warned. This is what marriage, this contract means. This is what it is. It's a commitment for life. Till death do us part, all right? But we don't seem to understand that. We meaning, you know, it's a lot easier to quit. It's a lot easier to run away, to walk away, because it does not require work. That's what commitment is. And you know what? Love without labor, love without work, Love without action is laziness. You are just nothing but a taker. You make demands, especially, I'm talking about women now. Don't claw me, okay? We want a good man. We want a good marriage. We demand it. But are you willing to be a good wife? Are you willing to be subservient to that priesthood okay I mean I know I'm not going to get a lot of amens with that including myself but you know what 
It is the truth. We're demanding, we're demanding a lot from our from men, you know, oh, I want this, that, and the other. But are you willing? Are you willing to make sacrifices as well? Do you want a good man, but you, you're not a good woman? Thank you, Sister Rowena. You know, if you want a good man, then you should be a good and godly woman. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, commitment costs too much. Commitment costs too much. And I'm not talking about the diamond ring, although that's part of it too. Okay, but commitment costs too much. Salvation is free, but commitment, discipleship costs a lot. It will cause you to work because you have to work out your own salvation. Not your neighbors, not your spouse, not your children's, but your own. Amen? And are you willing to invest in it? Are you willing to sweat, bleed, cry, and even die for it? Are you willing? If you have a passion, if you are committed to something that you believe in greater than your life, yourself, are you willing to sacrifice your life for it? I mean, I know... There are parents, right? Parents do that. You know, that they will cover their children, um, you know, like before their children get hurt. They would take the, the hurt first. But then, you know, probably not everybody would do that, but I think that's an instinctive reaction, you know? That is our commitment to our children, our flesh and blood. You know, that just, you just automatically almost, it's an automatic pilot that, you know, if they're facing harm and danger that you would rather take it, right, than, than them facing it or face it, amen? Real friendship requires a commitment. I'm talking about relationships still, friendship, right? Because that's really what we're made to be, to be, we're not made to live alone. We are made to be with people, okay? with the body of Christ. So which is why you can't be a real, good, genuine friend to everybody. You cannot accept every friend request. And I'm not talking about Facebook. Okay? You cannot. You cannot accept everyone as a friend. I mean, you can be nice. You can be friendly to them. You can be good and kind and helpful, but you cannot be their friend because it requires a commitment, right? right? Even Jesus knew that. Yes. He knew the heart of men. Let's go to, what is that scripture? John 2, 24. Amen. John 2, 24. So, you know, don't be offended when, you know, you're not a friend to everybody, because we need to realize what friendship really is and what it means. So, you know, it would really be good to study Jonathan and David um, because I think that's one great example of friendship. Amen. 2.24. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He knew the heart of men, okay? He has a multitude of people following him, and then he has some friends following him because, you know, they like what's on the menu, right? And then he has the inner circle, which was the 12, and one of them betrayed him, okay? So we should take an inventory it's the um, half of the month now, right? This is a good time to take a physical, emotional, you know, spiritual inventory of how good we have it and how good do we give. Again, it's about giving. Are you just a taker? Or do you give? Do you give generously? Do you give 
cheerfully? Do you give happily? And you know what? This applies on all, in all areas. Do you tip well? Do you share well? Do you give? You know, do you give like happily without, without advertising it, without saying anything? Do you give good gifts? Not because you want to be recognized, but because you're a giver. You have a heart to give. You're a generous person. And you're committed to doing that. You know, it's blessed to give than to receive. Amen. So do you want all the benefits without the responsibility? This is huge. Again, in, in a relationship or in the ministry, you want all the benefits, but you don't want the responsibility. You know that movie, um, it's a Marvel, oh my gosh, he crawls, Spider-Man. Like thinking, oh my gosh, is it Batman? Or he wears a mask also, so it's Spider-Man. You know, his uncle, right? They were having a conversation in an alley that with power comes great responsibility. Well, you know, with benefits, also comes great responsibility. Amen. Do you think you can just jump over commitment to shouting and hollering and praising without understanding? We need to learn how to give well, not just how to receive well. Okay, this is probably the time to learn the word reciprocity. That was a math term, although I hated math. But reciprocity, it means to be able to give equally than what you have been getting. What you get, you give back, and then some, if not more. Reciprocity. I mean, do you, how would you want to be in a relationship where all the time you're the one giving? Giving. Giving because you love the person. Giving because you care about the person. You give and give and give. But all they do is suck you dry. They demand more. The more you give, the more they take. And then there's nothing in return. Pretty soon, I don't care how holy you are, okay, how, how great you are, how spiritual you are, in the natural, in the physical, you will get tired. You will realize that, man, this relationship is not equally yoked. This relationship is not giving me anything in return. You know, men, right? Your wife's wife. I mean, men in plural. You know what I mean. The wives. You know, they're your helpmate. All right? We were watching this... Um, I think it's Malcolm X. And I just realized I didn't finish it. Too bad. But, um, you know, I was thinking that behind each of these great men, whether it be in politics or just, you know, who raised up and made a difference, made a mark in this world, they had a great helpmate behind the scenes. So, do not underestimate the power of commitment, sisters. Do not underestimate the power of your influence. Behind closed doors, when you make sense, when you talk sense and not demand, when you show that you can live up to what you're saying, when you can show that you can live up to even your demands, your own selfish demands, that you can actually give better and greater, your man will listen to you. Amen. Amen. The men are like, oh my gosh, sister, what are you talking about? I'm talking about commitment. I'm talking about influence. I'm talking about being in your spiritual authority, knowing that you can commit because God has committed to you. Amen. So, sowing and reaping. Do not think that you can reap that which you have not sown. If you sowed a lot of you know, falsities and anger and hypocrisy, what do you think you'll get? 
the law of reciprocity, you will get exactly what you've given. Amen. And in Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you the desires of your heart. How do you delight yourself in the Lord? By being faithful, committed to his word. And it's not just by coming to church, saints. We get that wrong. It's not, it's, it's not coming to church. It's not about church attendance. It's about following him wholly. That you are following him even when no one is watching you even when no one is looking at you, even when no one agrees with you, even when no one is applauding you, even when no one is praising you and everyone is criticizing you, that you remain the same, that you remain steadfast in the word, that you don't care, you're not easily moved, you're not easily distracted, and you're not easily offended. Amen? So if you think you're praying for blessings that the Lord even knows you won't be committed to, do you think he'll bless you? You're asking for something that he knows you're going to trample with. You're asking for something that you know he knows that you're not going to take care of. How do you expect him to bless you with that? Think about it. Aren't we the same way with our parents? I mean, with our children? Amen. So, what do we do? You put up a facade, you wear a camouflage, but you're getting old and you still don't have a clue of what you could have been because you're not willing to commit to anything difficult, challenging, or that will stretch your faith. You half study, you half step, you half labor, you're half present during the administration of the word and worship. You're half excited to be a part of the ministry. You show up thinking that this is your only and reasonable contribution. When you walk in a place, are you an asset or a liability? In your home, marriage, workplace, or in the church, which one are you? God is a definite and it says, a quote I saw today, there is only one degree of commitment. It's total. And the other one, it says absolute. Amen. God is a definite. He is the great I am who swears by his name. Amen. There's no other name greater than his. So he swears by his name, which means his word is true. His word means commitment. His word is Reality, amen? His promise is forever sealed by the Holy Ghost, signed by the blood of Jesus. So we are to be committed to God who gave us life. That's our first and foremost, number one to be committed to is God. God, right? It's God first. Seek ye first, Matthew 6, 33, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Just like in Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The next thing that we need to be committed to really is our family. Okay? I know that we didn't choose our families, and some of them, if not most of them, or not all of them are messed up, right? And that's why they need us. They need us to remain rooted because we could be their only and last hope. Whatever they've done, whatever happened to them, they're still your family, okay? You may not like that, you know, oh, so sad, too bad. I'm not saying, you know, condoning or tolerating. I'm talking about being there for them, being committed to them if and when they should ever need you. I'm not, I'm not talking about enabling or being a, what is that word? Uh, an enabler or what's the other word that I can't? Codependent. Thank you, sis. Codependent. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about commitment. They're your family, right? 
you know, you know when they're ready for help that you will be there, that you're not going to turn your back and snub them, right? Because your fart doesn't stink anymore, right? Okay, or that's what you think. Amen. So, you know, with family, we will get through this. That should be what we say. We will get through this. Through thick and thin, we will get through this. We will get through this. And then the church. The church. We need to be committed to the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ that Jesus actually died for and he will come back for. Amen. What do you give for all that you get? Do you give anything? And don't tell me about your tithe. You know, there was a cartoon. Let me see if I can find that. I know I, I, um, I like quotes, but with all these pages, I don't think I have it. Anyway, it's, like a, it's called like a light church. It's a cartoon that they depicted um, off of somewhere that says, this is a church that is a 7.5 tithing church. Not 10%, right? 7.5. And we only follow eight of the Ten Commandments, and it's whichever. And we don't expect anything, anything more than you're willing to give and then less. It's talking about, it's, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's, it's funny, but it's sad that, that this is like the state of the church right now. You know, the less that is required of me, the better I will be attending that church, right? I'm not going to go to a church that will stretch me because, gosh, I don't want them meddling in my, my business. Amen. Are you demanding more of God than you're willing to give him? Anytime you take more than you're willing to give to any relationship, you will live in perpetual discontentment. Patience will wither and hope will die. And the other person will eventually be convinced that you do not know the law of reciprocity, that you do not know the meaning of true commitment, that you do not know the meaning of giving. Say ouch if that's you and say amen if that's not you or you. Amen. What is your dream? Do you invest in your passion? Anybody can dream it until you're committed to it. Are you a well-wisher or a daydreamer? Without commitment, then that's all you are, and pretty soon you'll run out of people to blame for your failure and excuses. Right? You're getting older, but nothing's changing because you're not willing to commit to anything, and you're running out of people to take it out on. So, though the vision tarries, wait for it. No right to crown if you haven't picked up your cross. You have no right to the blessing if you haven't committed to giving. And if you're on your way to destiny, quit connecting to your history. You got to cut the ties. You want to see your destiny fulfilled? Cut the ties to your history. Quit looking back because you're made to look forward. Hallelujah. So what are you waiting for, right? We have a minute and a half. Now, I, I do want you to go to Habakkuk. This is, this is, this is a song that we used to sing. I'm not going to go ahead and bust out and sing, or maybe I will. In Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18, it's saying, this is his commitment. He says, though the fig tree fails to blossom and no fig or fruit be on the vine, yet will I praise him. Hallelujah. He just, he knows, he knows that 
Whether I am with or without, my commitment to God is the same way. And in Job 13, 15, even though he didn't really know what he was talking about, right? Job said, though he slay me, hallelujah, yet will I trust in him. That's commitment. That's showing trust. Because commitment is about trust. Trusting the person you're committing to. Trusting the person you're committed to. I still got more, but I got no time. Thank you for your time. Amen.